Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this seminar on infrastructure interdependencies and interacting at risks about minimizing the likelihood of cascading failures. Now, this is brought to you in association with the University of Birmingham, and it's mainly an op under the um, banner of the Infrastructure Operations Adaptation Forum. I'm John Dora, and I shall be moderating and hopefully keeping things to time today. And Dr. Emma Ferranti from Birmingham University is somebody that helped put this together with a lot of us over the past few weeks. Emma's got a short presentation uh, introducing the topic, so I'll hand over to Emma and ask everybody online and in the room here to, to sit back and enjoy what we're about to hear. Thank you. Thanks, John. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wow, I can also hear myself, which is a bit eerie. Okay, so um, welcome to our session. I'm really delighted to be here. My name is Emma Franti. I'm a member of the Infrastructure Operators Adaptation Forum and a senior lecturer at the University of Birmingham working in weather resilience and climate adaptation. Can you see my slides? You can, I can see them as well. Okay, so I thought I'd start this session by spending a few minutes thinking about what interacting risks are. So these can be multiple hazards happening in the same area. So for example, you could have a section of railway track or road infrastructure impacted by both the landslide and flooding following heavy rainfall. Or they could be when you have impacts cascading between systems our infrastructure networks are inter interdependent and sometimes you can have a failure in one system that causes failures in another system. So for example, if we have um, failure in our power supply or distribution, we can then have consequences, um, knock on consequences in the transport network or in information communication technology. Or an interacting risk can be when one, uh, when you have changes to one risk impacting another risk. So for example, when you have heavy rainfall increasing the chance of tidal flooding or it can be any kind of combination of one of the above. And these interacting risk events are often called black swan events. Um, black swan events are characterized by being very rare. They often have a really severe impact. And also by the fact that sometimes they're really obvious in hindsight. And I think that is where the um, problem lies. You know, How do you predict these things which are very rare? They have a severe impact, but they're kind of hidden in plain sight. So I've given a couple of examples of interacting risks. Um, first off, Hurricane Katrina in 2005, which really kind of changed the way we view these events, obviously um, after the events in hindsight, of course, and also flooding in Rio uh, de Janeiro in 2011, which led to an entirely new way of managing resilience in the city. And if you're interested in that, please come along to our event on the 11th of November, where we have the chief resilience officer for Rio de Janeiro talking about urban resilience. So I wanted to use the rest of this introductory session to spend a couple of minutes talking about um, an example of interacting risks and cascade failures from my hometown of Lancaster. So Lancaster is in Northwest England. It's a small city with a population of about 60,000. And it's in part of the country which is dominated by um, weather that comes from the Southwest and, and the West. And if I'm honest, it's a pretty uh, gray and wet place to live. Um, Lancaster is also, um, like many of our cities, it's built along the banks of a beautiful river, the River Loon. So in autumn 2015, I think it's fair to say that Lancaster was wet like it has never been wet before. Um, in the city, it rained every single day except for two for eight weeks straight. Um, in the catchment of the River Loon, it rained every single day apart from one. So you can imagine the situation in at the start of December in 2015, where the, land, the landscape is saturated, the river floors are very high. And then on the um, 4th and 5th of December, there was a really heavy two day rainfall event. And it was actually the heaviest rainfall event in history, although that has since been superseded twice. So you have this um, saturated landscape, high river flows, and then to top it all off, the River Loon is actually tidal at Lancaster, and there was an incoming tide that evening. So um, the initial impacts of all this rainfall was pluvial flooding. So there was lots of closures of local roads, and then as the water levels on the River Loon, on the river Loon rose, there was kind of flooding along the banks of the river, and then that kind of spilled out into the town. 
So the bus station was flooding and um, the local roads were flooded. This um, kind of prevented any kind of transport around the road network in Lancaster. Um, the fire station was flooded and had to be evacuated um, the, and they had to conduct the emergency response from a motorway service station uh, a couple of miles away. Because of all of the flooding and the high levels of water on the river, the, the bridges that crossed the River Loon also had to be closed and this kind of truncated the city. So you had um, the rescue centre on the north side of the river and the uh, majority of flooding on the south bank of the river and it was a really long way to kind of get from north to south Lancaster. So you've got all this water, the kind of flooding, the road closures, the, the evacuation of the fire station. And then if this wasn't bad enough, then you had the substation for the whole of the city located on the banks of the River Loon. And this is a legacy of history. You know, when they first put energy uh, supply into Lancaster, having a power station at the side of the river was the place to be. But the, flood uh, the substation was located on the river banks, it flooded, and then that led to power loss in Lancaster for more than 24 hours. And so this power outage in December in winter um, made it impossible to cook and to have heating unless you had gas and there was no lighting. If you look at the top picture there, you can see that um, the power distribution company had to send in um, mobile food stations so that people could get food. So um, but then again, if this kind of the local flooding and then if the um, loss of power wasn't bad enough, then you had this situation whereby there was no backup generators for the mobile base stations or for the broadband routers. So there was no mobile phones, no network, no digital radio. And there's effectively an ICT blackout for the whole duration of the, the power loss. And so all of these things combined led to the closure of most of the services in Lancaster. So the shops, the businesses, the transport, they were all closed. Lancaster University had to close and send its students home because, um, because it didn't have the facilities to kind of keep them safe without power. Many of the students struggled to get home unless their parents could collect them. And the bottom picture shows the students having to sleep in the Great Hall. So this was 2015. And um, it also caused disruption to healthcare services as well. And many, all local healthcare services, I think excluding the hospital, which had a backup generator had to close. So you can actually map um, all these interacting risks in a flowchart um, kind of from the start of the event where you had these multiple hazards all interacting together to lead to a, a substantial amount of flooding. And I think where, where the problems really began for the, across multiple infrastructure systems was the failure of the substation. You had this single point of failure from which all of the different kind of impacts cascaded. And, you know, the thing is, why, why, you know, why did, we, why did we not see this in advance? You know, a substation on the banks of the river is always going to be prone to flood risk. And I think that's really, the, that's really how these things are black swan events. They're almost hidden in plain sight. And this is what makes them really difficult to plan for. So I just wanted to conclude this presentation with some final thoughts. I think the first thing to say is that on that particular, I've spoken a lot about Lancaster. But on that particular weekend, Lancaster was not the only place affected by Storm Desmond. There was really um, profound flooding across Cumbria and I think up into southern Scotland. And that particular winter, it, Storm Desmond was not the only storm. There was Storm Eva and Storm Frank. And there was a tremendous amount of flooding across northern England and into Scotland. And I think, you know, although clearly this was an unfortunate thing to happen to Lancaster, Lancaster is a city which is very fortunate in many respects. It's relatively affluent. There are very low levels of inequality as compared to other parts of the UK and other parts of the world. And I wonder what the consequences could have been if this had happened somewhere else. So I think the last thing I want to say is that um, if this can happen in my hometown, can it happen in yours? Um, where will this happen next? And how can we predict and manage these interacting risks? And I think on that, I will pass over to Mike and he will talk a little bit more about interacting risks. Thank you. Uh, while, while the technology is working, um, I'll try and introduce myself. Um, there we go. Uh, can you see my screen yet? Mike, you should be able to share your screen now. I'm trying. <laughs> right, share screen. Let me know when you can see it. 
That looks like it. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, my name is Mike Woolgar. I'm a director at WSP uh, Consultancy. And uh, we were employed along with um, our partners, Risk Solutions, um, RSK um, ADAS, University of Surrey and University of uh, City London, uh, UCL, to look at the um, understandings of interacting risks in, in the sort of sense that uh, Emma's been talking about. So, um, quick agenda, background and method, uh, results in some of our key findings and some thoughts. And it's just really to, to try to sort of canter through the job that we did. It, it was a, a fairly lengthy project for 18 months. Uh, so I'm gonna canter through that as quick as possible. The aims and objectives of the project were <clears throat> the Committee of Climate Change um, have to produce a, a risk assessment every five years or so. And in the, the this risk assessment number two, uh, they decided, uh, discovered that they were I need to get rid of this, my screen. Yeah. They decided that they, they had information around interacting risks that they were occurring, but they hadn't really understood or finding it hard to understand how the links might be better um, established. So <clears throat> the research questions we were given were, they were quite lengthy uh, and, and difficult to address in the 18 months, but uh, what are the interactions between climate change risks in the natural built environment and infrastructure? How do they affect the overall risk? How do they affect uh, interactions to different, different locations? And we, we were looking at England, looking at Wales, looking at Northern Ireland, and looking at Scotland, as well as UK. Um, and that presented its own difficulties because, um, as Emma has been mentioning, um, these cascade effects tend to be quite local or, or regional, but not national. And we were looking at national level, so that's quite difficult. What is the likelihood and consequences of these risks? Um, what sort of responses could decision makers around adaptation make to address them. And then an important one, what other opportunities and benefits could arise from these interactions? So the black swan says bad, but are there any, any good things as well? So in terms of the method, um, we did four stages. Um, I'm going to really talk mainly about uh, one, two, and three, because stage four was really to do with um, uh, promoting the next stage for CCRA four, climate change risk assessment four. So it's a literature review, method developments, assessing and prioritizing interactions, and then looking at some of the thoughts uh, and things that we could, we could uh, derive from, from the approach we were taking. So <clears throat> when our first stage was, was quite lengthy, I was trying to find a, a tool or a system we could actually look to be able to examine, test, look at sensitivities for climate uh, interactions, infrastructure interactions. So we needed tools that would be sufficiently flexible, scalable, uh, from the small to the large, but we were starting at large, not over data hungry. And this was a real big issue because um, the data that we might need for this um, are quite sparse uh, in places. It needs to be reasonably credible and visual to support ready understanding. And that, that would support the credibility. So <clears throat> we, oh, I've gone too far, please me. So what, what we did was we, um, worked with uh, our university colleagues and, and with uh, people who are sectoral specialists in various assessment tools. Um, and we eventually settled on a tool called the Bayesian Belief Network, which is a dependency model. It uh, shows uh, cause and effect in chains. Uh, and that was able to be supported in terms of calculation estimation by Open Markov software, which is um, an open source software, which allows you to calculate the, the risks, uh, relative risk and impacts of sequences of events. So we looked for the, um, the Bayesian Belief Network process. We captured sequences of events and cascades from the, the driver through to outcome. Um, and then every node in our event chain, I'll show you a map in a moment, every node in our event chain has a probability range uh, of the likelihood of happening and an impact range, um, which we, we did through a, a sort of framework of cost impact ranges uh, and then uh, sorry someone saying something sorry saying something. Um, we um we had to develop some of the information for this and the data for this so we used to work with met office met office was helping us to uh, to develop um the sort of scenarios that we were looking at we were looking essentially at two um climate change um, tracks. One was a, a two degree centigrade rise by 2100, and the other one was a four degree rise by 2100. And we were looking at scenarios of impacts at 2050 and 2080 along those tracks. And Met Office were able to support us by giving us uh, information about sea level rise um, 
likelihoods, sea level rise, uh, quantum, uh, rainfall, uh, and, 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 the, and other factors like that. So um, we also had input from Cambridge Econometrics, who were another researcher for CCRA. Um, they were looking at um, economic growth, uh, demographics, in order to be able to scale some of the impacts which could occur from these interacting risks in the absence of any adaptation um, uh, methods other than the ones that have already been planned. And we had a lot of interaction with stakeholders, various stakeholders from sectors, from the rail sector, from um, communications, from water, from uh, ut energy utilities, in order to be able to understand and to work with them to develop these maps uh, and to look at risks and probabilities and to agree those uh, as, a, as an expert group. And we developed 12 maps. Um, the 12 maps we developed were around uh, extreme rainfall and sea rise, um, storms, extreme temperature rises, reduced rainfall to drought, um, and each of those against infrastructure, built environment, and the natural environment. And here's a, a sort of a, one of the maps. Uh, and what it does is it shows on the left the, the sort of the, the thing that's driving the, the, the problem. And then as you move forward to um, from, from left to right, you look at event nodes and impact nodes. And uh, each of these nodes, as I said earlier, has a, um, a probability of an event happening, uh, assuming the precedent event, uh, and then the impact, uh, a range of impacts, which allows us to test um, the overall impact uh, of a, a set of these chains of sequences um, in terms of a, um, it's a non-dimensional number, but it gives you an idea of the relative risk, relative changes in risk. So we use the open Markov um, modeling tool, uh, and this shows you uh, one of the two main models we used. We, we, we split the models, uh, the maps into two main models. Um, we sat work with our, um, our sort of research partners and the stakeholders, um, and we agreed that the, the wet side of um, the climate events were really not, not um, likely to be interacting with the dry side at the same time. So the drought and the temperature and the cold and the wet. So we separate them into, into, two, into two separate maps, um, two separate models, uh, and we ran those. And these are the risk pathways with the, that were combined from the various maps. And I've just highlighted a, a, a couple of, um, of sort of routes you could take through it. So increase in summer temperature, heat wave gives you very hot days, buildings are overheated, building productivity loss, and that gives you a, a, an outcome. Or increase in power and water demand, or in, in IT comms and infrastructure overloaded and overheated. So they, they can follow these all of these things through. And the second main model shows, um, for example, on the left-hand side, we've got an extreme rainfall event, which can lead to river surface groundwater flooding, or damage in river flows, or extreme rain on saturated ground, as was mentioned by Lanc Lancaster. And these, these cascade forward into things like a reservoir failure, like sewage, water sewage into, into uh, infrastructure flooding, sewer flooding, travel delays, etc. And these are all worked through on, on the system of calculator. A, a relative change of overall risk magnitude. We ran three main models. One was the baseline scenario, um, looking at pathways for trying to establish what the sort of highest risk levels were. And these are things which we had discussed previously with our stakeholder group, uh, and we discussed with the other researchers uh, working for uh, Committee of Climate Change. Um, and these were things that we assumed would be quite high, <laughs> um, which is a, a bit of a concern, but actually we had thought this. And as, as we worked the, the, um, um, the workshops, they were shown to be the most likely ones to have occurred and have occurred. Uh, but there were some others that, that appeared um, as we ran through the later scenarios, the 20 and 50, um, uh, 2050 and 2080 uh, models. Um, and this is just a, a selection of some of the things that we found from the, um, from the events, uh, increasing severity of drought leading to water supply disruption, obviously, uh, increasing summer temperatures, um, and increasing the probability of drought. Sea level rise was one of the most significant ones, clearly. Uh, there's no doubt about it, but sea level rise uh, has been mentioned as, a, as a, an, an influence for the Lancaster, uh, Lancaster, Lancaster um, situation. And we are going to face around the UK 
uh, considerable pressures from sea level rise. Some of our coastlines are, are, are very susceptible to it. And of course, we have an enormous amount of, uh, of legacy infrastructure, which is going to be impacted on it if we don't do something to adapt to it. Um, in terms of, I have to scatter through this, I'm afraid, because we've got a very short period of time. In terms of the, um, some thoughts and recommendations, yes, interdependencies have been revealed by recent events, and our modeling shows, including a wide range of, uh, of sensitivity testing through our modeling, that the, in the absence of any considered action, a considerable action, the climate change will tend to exacerbate the potential risks. And a lot of those potential risks are fixed. They are the legacy issues. Most of our, not most, but an awful lot of our assets are uh, established along the coast, along rivers. Uh, and that's just the way the, the economy grew up in the past. Um, and so an awful lot of these assets, um, even in the absence of climate change impacts, are likely to become damaged anyway by flooding. Um, we have more assets at risk, and therefore, even in the absence of climate change, um, we're going to have more, um, more damage available from, from current events. Clearly, the climate change is going to exacerbate that. We think that the, as part of the um, adaptation, asset owners and operators do really need to understand more um, about how changing external hazards will impact their assets and operations and also people with whom they are interdependent. So there's a lot of talk about um, water companies having to become resilient in the round, and that's absolutely a great idea to be resilient to all of the things that are, that are going to uh, afflict water companies. Um, including power, power outages, including flooding of assets, et cetera. And there's a lot of work that's been done on that. But in the future, um, as, as um, our assets become more susceptible uh, in the absence of um, good understanding of the risks and, and investments and changes to operations, um, we're gonna need to make sure that there's more cooperation between some of our uh, providers utility providers, for example, uh, in order to be able to respond and react in the most cost-effective way. It isn't just going to be something you can build your way out of. We're going to have to have more effective contingency plans, more cooperative agreements, and also more management of the natural environment in order to support our, um, our assets, our operations, our economic life, by making sure that the environment is, is as supportive as possible, uh, the natural environment as supportive as possible. There is quite a good report that was produced by the Institute of Directors just recently about resilience and how companies which um, have previously not thought so much about the interdependencies between themselves and their supply chain, between themselves and their utility suppliers, between themselves and their customers, um, how they should start to create such a plan for a business. I think that's a, that's a, that's a rational response to what's going on. We probably need more government support. We probably need more um, effort between the various uh, groups of, of suppliers and providers to create uh, a more um, resilient response to the interdependency by building on that interdependency where we can, not ignoring it uh, and not trying to rush off and do things alone, but think about how those interdependencies might become strengths rather than weaknesses. Do not forget potential for benefits. I think. Um, one of the things that, that has become clear to me, I work a lot in the water sector, is that we become very, very good at designing and operating closer and closer to the limits of, our, of the capacity. And that's eroded headroom. Now, headroom isn't the answer to everything, but if we have eroded our headroom in all of our interconnected systems, then we are going to become more susceptible to, um, to attack, if you like, by events. So I think that um, there's going to have to be a discussion around what sort of level of headroom per provider is needed, who provides that headroom, and how do you optimize the group headroom uh, between, so that, the, that there is resilience between the, the, the multiple operators, between the people who are interdependent, and how do we, how do we optimize that? Uh, and that is a policy question. It's also something that um, needs to be researched a bit better in order to understand how um, we might work out the cost of it and how we might allocate those costs. 
in order to provide a bit more, call it insurance, insurance to our system. Uh, I've run out of time. I've left on the bottom of this um, slide here a couple of um, links. One is to the report that we wrote, which is on the um, uh, Committee on Climate Change website. Uh, and also on that website is an interacting risks map, which you can play with. You can actually look down the, the maps. You could actually extract um, um, information from that for chains that are relevant to you. Uh, I think that it might be easier to use these uh, interactive, uh, these uh, system maps at a more local scale, because it's more likely that the granularity, the quality of the information and data that you can collect will be more relevant. But I think one should look at these things perhaps and test out what ifs, because as Emma said, black swan events do occur. Um, if you can start to think about the range of events that might occur, you can start to defend yourself. I think I've run out of time, so I'm going to stop sharing and go back to screen. Emma. Hello. Thanks, Mike. I think it's over to John. Thanks, Mike. I'm trying to. Thank you, Mike. We've now got Anya Nivrazo from the Resilient Shift talking about Cape Town. Anya. Thanks very much, John. So uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to present today. My name is Anya Nivrazel, um, and I'll be presenting uh, some stories from Cape Town Day Zero. So I work for the Resilience Shift, uh, which is supported by Lloyd's Register Foundation and hosted by Arup. And the Resilience Shift is helping to build a global community equipped with the knowledge and tools that are needed to drive practice towards better, more resilient critical infrastructure. We're focusing on tools and approaches to put this shift in resilience thinking into practice um, and identifying drivers and enablers for infrastructure resilience. Um, we're looking to advance a common understanding of resilient systems, both within and between critical sectors. So we sum this up as influencing policy, shaping practice and sharing learning. So critical infrastructure systems uh, provide essential energy, water transport, and communication services, and they underpin food, healthcare, and education. When the critical infrastructure protecting, connecting, or providing essential services for communities fail, uh, the consequences can be catastrophic for people, for the environment, and for the economy. Therefore, it's essential that infrastructure um, is prepared for the threats that we can anticipate um, and also is able to respond to the unexpected so that it can continue to provide the essential services on which society depends. So all critical infrastructure across energy, water, transport and communication services is highly connected. Um, interdependencies, uh, interdependencies between services dictate the complexity of the system. The more connections that exist, the more complex a system is, and therefore the more vulnerable a system can be to externalities, shocks, and stresses. Physical interdependencies arise from physical linkages between the inputs and outputs, um, and we heard about some of those from Emma earlier on. Uh, and a straightforward example of this is imagining a rail network and a coal-fired electrical generation plant. While they operate separately from one another, the electrical generation plant relies on the delivery of coal from a rail network and assuming that the rail network runs on electricity, it too relies on the plant. Therefore, if one fails, the other may also fail. However, what I want to focus on today are um, those systems that underpin the functionality of the physical infrastructure. Economic infrastructure, such as transport, water, digital comms and energy, are the foundation on which the socioeconomic infrastructure such as government, education, healthcare, food and manufacturing relies on to function. Society as a whole depends on these services that are provided by the infrastructure systems. And conversely, the infrastructure systems are also tightly coupled to the communities who use them, 
thus creating a highly interconnected uh, system of systems that includes social, environmental, and technical elements. So an excellent example of this um, and these types of interactions is, is uh, seen in the example of Cape Town Day Zero event, which I'll talk about. So I'd like to guide you through the vital role that community and the social systems played in avoiding what would have been a significant humanitarian incident. But first, for just a little bit of context about Cape Town, um, it's home to over 4 million residents. Um, and many of these live in um, middle-class suburban neighborhoods, but there are also 150,000 households who have no access to direct running water. Um, and nearly one third of the city's residents cannot afford to pay for this basic right. Um, and these social inequalities run along racial lines, which is a consequence of the country's um, social and political history. Um, and the effects of these are still felt today. Many white Cape Tonians enjoy higher salaries and more comfortable lives with black and colored folk being more socially and economically vulnerable. Typically, uh, Cape Town experiences a Mediterranean climate with warm and dry summers and milder, wetter winters. So uh, in Cape Town, the Department of Water and Sanitation, um, it's responsible for the provision of water across the whole of South Africa, but then within Cape Town, the city and municipality is responsible for the distribution um, across the city and surrounding areas. The city re receives the vast majority of its water, about 98%, um, from six dams that are located outside the city. Um, and these reservoirs are typically replenished during the wetter winter months um, and exhausted during the drier summer months. Um, they supply the city many neighboring towns and also local farmers with water throughout the year. So the allocation of these resources requires complex governance structures to ensure that all of the stakeholders receive what they require. Given the um, city's heavy reliance on seasonal rainfall, vulnerabilities in the system became apparent for the first time in over 40 years when the winter rains were not as plentiful in 2015 as they had been in previous years. Then over the course of the following two winters, the situation didn't improve um, and the reservoirs around Cape Town were not sufficiently replenished um, uh, because there was uh, no rain at that time or very little rain. Um, so the last time uh, that there had been three consecutive dry winters was in the early 70s and there was only about 1 million people in Cape Town at the time. Um, but the effects of climate change mean that the likelihood of droughts like these are increasing and the city um, is likely to face severe events such as this more frequently. Um, and given that there was in 2017-18 uh, a real risk of Cape Town not making it through the summer months with sufficient water, um, it seemed almost inevitable that the city would reach um, what they called a day zero scenario. Uh, and day zero would have undoubtedly spelt a uh, catastrophe for the city. So this was a disaster management plan that was put in place that would be triggered if the dam levels fell below a 15% threshold. Um, and it was called the day zero plan. And many experts at the time felt that it was unavoidable um, and it would have seen the supply of water redirected to water distribution centers. Um, and that would have been installed throughout the city. Um, and such distribution centers are not uncommon in the informal settlements already, um, but a societal shift this significant um, would have, you know, left a, a raft of consequences and a fundamental change in how the city operated, how people went about their lives and how they interacted with one another. Ultimately, the disaster was averted, um, and this is through a combination of both technical solutions such as reducing the water pressure um, that was distributed um, and also through individuals changing their habits, including um, reducing the amount of water that they consumed um, and also installing rainwater collection tanks, personal ones in their, in their own property. Um, and the campaign to avoid day zero undoubtedly helped the city to avoid the implementation of this uh, disaster management plan. Um, but there were some negative consequences as well, including economic losses related to the 
um, drop in tourism that resulted from the campaign gaining traction on the global stage. So as part of uh, the resilience shift's work to make resilience tangible, practical, and relevant, we supported the completion of a suite of in-depth interviews um, with key individuals who were involved in the management of the 2017-18 water crisis um, and developed film-based learning modules that distills down lessons from the event. The following two examples uh, succinctly demonstrate uh, the potential repercussions that the implementation of the Day Zero Disaster Management Plan would have brought about. And this first clip uh, features Ferris Kaur, the Group Head of Sustainability at Woolworths, um, whose thoughts on the potential ramifications of the introduction of communal water distribution centres really exemplify the complexities and the consequences that this would have had on supply chains and livelihoods across the city. And I think once we started unpacking that, we realized, well, just how realistic is this? Because if we take it from our perspective as a retailer and you, you break it down into, I've got staff who work at various points in the supply chain. And let's imagine at a store level. So people, we, we, we supply food to people, people rely on us to buy the food. Now, the, the people who work in that store would be, people who need to stand in a queue for water. So the question is, if you break it down, is the person who opens the store at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., did, where did they get their water from to ensure that the family was provided for that day? And assuming somehow or the other they skewed somewhere and they got water in time, how did they get to work? Because if they take public transport, did the train driver or the bus driver have water? Or did that company provide water? So they got to the store. Is the mall environment, we might be in malls and that kind of thing. Are they open because is all the security there? Is everybody also operating at mall? Did they stand in the queue at this water collection point that the city had made available to collect water? Assuming all of them did and we opened, did we have all our staff there? Did all of those staff? Um, initial plans were, we weren't sure what's gonna happen with schools. So assuming schools were closed, what would happen to parents of small kids? If the kids couldn't go to school and parents, working class parents have no alternative, uh, arrangements, you can expect them to leave the kids alone at home. Would they come into work? So assuming they made a plan and they came into work, we get food delivered to us by our logistics partner, brings in from our warehouse. All the same questions happen at the DC. Did all the staff at the distribution center have water? Did they have enough water to clean the place? Have we kept hygiene levels up? Could they, could they pack the truck? Could the, the truck driver bring the, the, the product to store? Did, was the fuel depot working to fill the truck? Because did all the fuel workers have water in their houses? Did the refinery have water to make the fuel? And suddenly, once we started thinking of this, we realized that this is a this is an impact that literally we could have come to sense. So what we learned from this video was that in order for an, an intervention as fundamental as changing the way in which a city receives its water to be successful, incredibly complex and detailed um, engagement with a wide range of stakeholders needs to be understood in really an incredible amount of detail. Um, and it's only through kind of that engagement with a really wide range of stakeholders um, could such an implementation be undertaken um, without unforeseen vulnerabilities coming to the fore and without vital life-sustaining services being disrupted? So in this um, second example, the CEO of Western Cape Town Economic Development Partnership, Andrew Borain, talks us through a situation in which the supply of water is restricted in certain neighborhoods and the likely economic and socio socio-political ramifications that that would bring about. It was announced that in the points of distribution system, the municipality would keep the taps on in the informal settlements for good reason around public health, um, that people from neighboring communities where perhaps the water was being shut off would descend on the areas where the taps were being left on uh, with serious consequences around water wars. And similarly in the uh, um, 
economic areas, the central business districts, the industrial areas. Obviously, the city was trying to ensure that they would keep that water on for as long as possible, which was correct, um, because you, you, you want the jobs to continue. You want the economy to continue even through a day zero crisis. But what would that have meant for people from residential areas where water has been turned off? Instead of going to queue for hours to get your 25 litres, you go to the industrial area, you go to the, uh, the, the areas of the economy and steal water there, steal water from work, effectively. So all these were, were tense questions swirling around in the debate. <clears throat> and for a while, there were no answers. No, no one was stepping up and saying, uh, this is the way forward. And so I think that exacerbated the sense of crisis. There was a real physical crisis, but there was also a social and psychological crisis in our society. Uh, mentioned previously, the situation was avoided um, through a combination of socio-technical environmental solutions. Um, and this situation highlighted that we really must think through interdependencies much more widely than just thinking about the physical ones. Uh, we need to think about societal interdependencies, and this was the point that Farouz made, um, and also environmental interdependencies. We saw that the drought hit all parts of the city together. Um, and just uh, on my final slide, I just wanted to say that it's, it's for this reason of thinking through all of these interdependencies that the experiences and insights gained in Cape Town were captured, collated, and they've been made available um, to industry experts, local officials, stakeholders in other cities. They're available for free online. Um, and this is through the Cape Town Drought Response Learning Initiatives. Um, and they have worked tirelessly alongside um, Resilience Shift uh, to bring together the insights from this event, um, which, you know, yields a lot of lessons worldwide that's not just relevant to uh, water um, resources. So the, this initiative documented observations, uh, insights and reflections on the crisis using a, a filmed uh, archive in-depth interviews with individuals who were involved, uh, including the two clips that were shown today. Um, and this was uh, conceptualized and um, executed um, by Peter Willis and Victor von Aswegen. Um, and the initiative really uh, is a groundbreaking template for post-crisis uh, learning globally. Um, and thank you for listening. And if you'd like to find out any more about this project, please go to resilienceshift.org. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. I'd like now to invite my um, colleague and friend, Nick Pyatt from Climate Sense to talk about pathways. Over to you, Nick. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone in the room and uh, everybody online. I'd like to talk about uh, pathways to resilience through stakeholder engagement. Certainly in the UK and other parts of the world, we're finding that as people start to think about resilience for areas, they're gathering lots of information and then a bit overwhelmed by the information and thinking, well, what do we do next? And this is about an approach for those early stages for bringing people together to start unpacking what the interdependencies are and where the options for action are. So let's think about some of the starting conditions for stakeholder engagement of the sort we're thinking about. One is that quickly we recognize the issue, resilience issues are systemic. That everybody in that system, all the key players are experts in their bit of the system, but nobody is an expert in the whole system. One of the key things about being overt about that in the, the very beginning of the process is that if people are feeling a bit vulnerable, are we going to be heard in this process? It's recognized everybody in this process is an expert in their bit of the system. It also requires everybody to accept that 
The other people in the room are experts in their bit, whether or not you like the, out the outcome of the application of their expertise. And it requires the facilitators to listen to people as experts. Also recognizing that people, decision makers are rarely completely in control of the options that they have. They usually, their options are affected by others, but also their decisions have an impact on the options available to other people. And so with those thoughts, holding the group together and convening with those concepts, we then understanding that issues are systemic. So how do we turn those into a coherent conceptual, uh, as concept of co co coherent systemic resilience? I'm just going to go through a series of points that we think you can achieve some of the things you can achieve out of a process that facilitates with that sort of way. And then we're going to look at a case study. We can collectively recognize what the changing climate risks will be, who is impacted, how they're impacted, options for retaining resilience at a systemic level, thresholds where new action can be needed and existing plans or future plans stop to stop functioning effectively. How decisions of one stakeholder affect others. Different levels of readiness for those threshold conditions and those changing, changing climate conditions. And what different assumptions people have about the nature of risk and how it can be addressed. And also understand, looking for where the gaps in understanding are. So the, the example, the case study we're going to look at is a piece of work we did in Somerset. A wrapper is an, a, the sort of approach we're looking at, which is a rapid adaptation pathways assessment process. And in this process, we're not necessarily looking at bringing in a lot of external information. What we're doing is working with the expertise in the room. Preparing by mapping the system, who are the key decision makers that we want to bring into this discussion? And what we did in this particular case was think who in the county makes long-term climate vulnerable decisions which would be vulnerable to climate change. And this is the group who came and joined a second exercise. The first exercise had a few more people who weren't able to join the second exercise. But what we did was to bring together a group of experts of, or sorry, I beg your pardon, from the stakeholder groups, bring the decision makers and take them through some of those questions. Is their climate risk changing? How, what, how do their plans start, stand up to those climate risks? What are the interdependencies? By the end of the morning, they were quite shaken by the implications of climate change on their decisions and not knowing what to do about it. So they said, please tell us what to do. So we invited them to send along their techies, not the decision makers, but the people who understood the implications of their plan and the limits of its possibility. So we had a second session and this is who we brought along. So um, if you will excuse me, John, on my side, there's a pointer. Could you bring the pointer please? Thank you. So these are the organizations that we brought along, different depart the council, council as a whole and different operating departments within it. Thanks. District councils in Somerset, they had four district councils who also have levels of infrastructure and long-term decision-making functions. The Environment Agency, a major partner in this process. The Federation of Small Businesses. Now, they were a key voice because they make almost no long-term decisions, but they're a key victim of the decisions of others. And we'll learn a little about that more in the case study. Highways England, internal drainage boards, a key area of vulnerable areas is very low lying and very prone to flooding. Natural England, network rail, the Rivers Authority, the Wildlife Trust, the water companies, the power distribution company, 
Some of the major power generation companies in the, the, uh, the county weren't able to join this exercise, but were very interested in it. Now, this is a busy slide. It's an extract from the sort of process, the outputs of the project, but I'm going to just draw some stories from this particular case. Those people in the room, I'll be able to point. Sadly, those people online, hopefully we'll be able to follow the story as we follow the different lines in this diagram. What we have here is a series, a number of different actions and possibilities that were drawn out by the stakeholders. And the concept that in some cases that there is a limit to what they could do in, in terms of climate risk and or under, under changing climate risk and sometimes possibilities of actions that would follow reaching of those thresholds. In this particular diagram, uh, we're looking at response to particular flu particularly fluvial flood risk. We looked at a number of other sorts of flood risk. In this case, if you look along the, uh, the axis at the bottom, it's the percentage in change of peak river flow. So at the zero on the left-hand side, this is current risk of flooding up to a doubling of peak river flow. And for this particular area, the uh, high case scenario now, probably since this piece of work that people have to work to is about 85% increase in peak river flow. So it's, it's a good overlap here. The first line was a bit of a shocker for most people in the room. The most vulnerable areas to flooding in the county are very low-lying, low -lying, they're at or below sea level. And a lot of the infrastructure cuts across there that feeds not only Somerset, but the, the economy of the southwest of England. And that's protected because the Environment Agency pump water away from those assets during flooding periods. The internal discussion with the Environment Agency was, this practice is uneconomical, and we're going to have, probably have to reduce it or even stop it. Nobody else in the room under, had understood that, and immediately they found that their assumptions that that pumping would continue, and that's the basis of their resilience plans, were no longer safe. So there's a whole set of interdependencies thrown up by that. So there was also an understanding that the current local flood defense system would have a limit to its viability. Its viability. They couldn't work out what to do beyond that because the system is simply overwhelmed at that threshold point. And that's long before the threshold, the, the, the limit of peak river flow that even now they have to be thinking about. And that threshold would come a lot closer if the pumping by the Environment Agency was reduced or stopped. The electricity, electricity distribution company was really interesting. They had a really resilient plan. They knew what they were going to defend. They knew what they wasn't going to defend. They weren't going to defend substations, but simply if flooding got to three meters regularly enough, they just move it higher into the air. And everyone thought, oh, that's a good simple plan, except the most vulnerable areas are really quite pretty. And the planners were going to say, you can't put your substation in the air because it's not attractive in a pretty area. And all of a sudden the planners started to understand the limits or the implications of their planning decisions and whether those priorities were the right ones for the resilience of the county. I'm coming to an end now, but I'm going to jump to a couple of things here. One was um, some of the roads works. And here we had, lower down, we had um, upgrading roads, upgrading county roads, and then stopping upgrading the county road and have simply regular rerouting of traffic. Now, this is why the Small, the, uh, small Business Federation was involved. The previous time there had been a flood like that, redirected traffic had gone away from not only from flooded areas, but huge non-flooded areas. People had assumed that those areas were flooded and didn't go there. And local businesses, small local businesses, lost massive amounts of volume, of, of, of revenue. The biggest imp economic impact in the county was on non-flooded businesses. And that was a communication issue. 
And the communication guys just hadn't understood that. But bringing the voice of the Small Business Federation, who had understood that, into the room helped people understand those interdependencies. There's a, load of other, a lot of other stories, including Network Rail, which was an important story, but we're coming to an end, so I'm going to jump on to that. One of the things we can start to do at those threshold points then is to say, well, okay, who makes the decisions to make those changes? Who influences them? Who is impacted by them? And we can then start to create the, la the decision-making landscape that helps us identify possibility for change, where there might be poss possibility to change the way decisions are being made now so that we can get greater resilience. That's a powerful process too, and creates a sense of possibility. But do we all work, then work happily and go off into a, a bright resilience sunset? No, we don't. Because information's important, but it doesn't necessarily make us more aware. And even if we're more aware, that doesn't necessarily mean, lead to meaningful action. Why not? Partly because of adaptive capacity. The different levels of adaptive capacity to actually make a change can be very significant within organizations. These profiles are different profiles from different cities. And you can see that different, different adaptive capacity profiles will generate different outcomes. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. And we can pick up any questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. I'd like now to invite Rowan Hamden from XDI to talk about the power of data. Thank you. Uh, g'day, I'm Rowan Hamden. I'm the CEO of XDI. We're a technology company that does hard numbers on cross-dependency resilience for infrastructure. And so what I'll do is um, uh, I'll briefly touch on our tech. I've got an announcement today, which we said we'd do a COP, so I'll go through that. Um, and so we work everywhere. We're a global company. We test infrastructure all over the world for all sorts of different companies, banks, property owners, investment funds, superannuation trusts, governments. And so essentially we are used by these institutions to plan for the impacts of uh, essentially weather uh, now and under climate change on everything they own or they, they intend to construct and, uh, and work out how they're gonna spend money to keep it resilient and keep their community safe going forward. Uh, I will just touch on this. It's, it's important to understand exactly what's going on this is the most technical slide, so I ask you to bear with me. So essentially, the secret source of what we do is we are able to um, place an asset as it's constructed, this building with glass, its walls, its type of roof, its wind tolerance standard, its earthquake standard, its, uh, sorry, soil movement standard, and test it as the weather shifts over time. We'll tell you when the walls will start to fail, when the thermal tolerance will be exceeded. And that helps to plan out uh, the resilience of those institutions, of those buildings. So as the, re the way we do that is at every location, we drop a pin and we drill through hundreds of different layers of weather and climate data and context information and work out return frequencies of extreme events. Of course, things break in the extremes, not in the averages. And then we force those probability distributions forward under climate change. We then build the structure. Uh, so, that, so we know what's going to cause the damage. We've got to see how it responds. Assets can be perfectly resilient in a highly hazardous situation as long as they're designed properly. And so you, we, we test it based on engineering standards and construction codes to see when it'll fail, fail and over what time period to generate uh, essentially uh, a loss and value factors or loss and value metrics based on dollars and probabilities that are used to calculate financial impacts. We cover a large range of hazards and are bringing on more every year. So we do extreme heat, coastal inundation, flooding, wind, soil movement, forest fire, freeze thaw, which is a, might affect Scotland actually. Um, hurricane, we're just bringing on now. Uh, the convective storm, we should get on probably early next year and then we're gonna start working on erosion next year. So, um, and so we just keep bringing on, we're very science driven. We try to be very factual in what we do. Uh, we do all, all sorts of different infrastructure. We've been doing this for a long time, over a decade now. We've had many clients and many different infrastructure sectors. 
and we've got hundreds of different default asset types. There's all context setting for what I'm going to talk about. So it's a global platform, it's a global solution. So basically we, we place assets in the landscape that we might do an area view like this, they might be interested, what's my council boundary? How does this affect my water management area and the assets within it? And so that's sort of our most broad course scale. Uh, typically, we actually just work on individual assets. So here, this is an analysis of um, some company's asset base. We place an asset there as constructed. We test its full asset base, and the company can look at its full resilience. And so individual assets are assessed, and then you can also aggregate to look at um, yeah, the, the effect across a portfolio of assets. Um, it gets, but because we're doing individual assets, you can go a lot deeper. You can not only place their assets, you can place all of their supply chain services. Every, everywhere there's a substation, everywhere there's a, there's a water pump, everywhere there's a gas main, everywhere there's a road. You can test all of the infrastructure that the supply chain services rely on to look at transferred risk. So if there's a 4% chance that that substation will be failed by flooding in 2030, that risk transfers to the asset that they'll lose power at that rate at that time. So, um, and so you can do these probabilistic and weighted averaged uh, financial metrics on the probability of failure, work out your most vulnerable assets in your asset base based on your suppliers under investment in their infrastructure, not on your resilience planning in your own infrastructure. And that helps work through the um, adaptation strategies that you need to work through as an institution. And we're a very democratised company. We try to make this information as available as possible so that not only the rich people of the world or those who have the assets um, who are able to take advantage of this information and plan accordingly, but you, the householder, the uh, asset owner or the community member can access the same information and be able to understand how others are assessing risk on your assets and your property. We have various mechanisms to be able to bring that to you. And so that's, that's the you know, householder report. That's a more commercial report for a commercial institution. But we're taking it even further. So our goal, and linked more closely to this whole technology and uh, infrastructure development, is to set up a physical risk platform that essentially covers the entire planet run every piece of infrastructure in the world, have it sitting in a single system, you can log in, you can map interdependencies, all the assets are run. And uh, yeah, it's, it's essentially, for us, it's just a scale issue. We only need one order of magnitude more capacity to be able to run this than what we currently do, because we regularly run millions and millions of assets for individual clients. And so, yeah, as I say, we do this all the time. We basically flood entire cities flood, actually terrible term, especially in Eastburn. Um, we cover entire cities with assets uh, and we put, a, we put a building everywhere there's a building. We put a road every, everywhere there's a road section. We run those systems and, um, and the scale gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, all the way to the point that recently we ran the entire UK. And so we ran all 35 million locations everywhere there's an address. We placed a building at every address in the UK. This was for banking services clients as part of the TCFD compliance arrangements. And so they used all this data to do their financial metrics for the um, what's called the CBES, the Climate Biannual Assessment Standard. We've today just released that. This is our announcement where we're saying this, this information is available to you, the people of the UK, and this is the basis of us rolling out our ecosystem of across the world where we're doing this country by country. So this is the sixth or seventh country we've done this for, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Netherlands, Switzerland, I think we'll be doing the US next year. And so we're making this information available uh, for the point of uh, flagging areas of risk where there are uh, issues that need to be managed by communities. So, you know, there's a couple of headlines. Sorry, that's a laser. So that, actually, that looks better. So um, there's a couple of headlines that come out of this. So we'd expect, based on the risk modelling done in this report, that there'd be a five-fold increase of insurance costs across the UK uh, as a result of increased risk across a large number of the uh, properties resulting from all the different hazards that we've assessed. And the numbers are relatively scary, but you know, you can see, everyone should expect to see insurance premiums arise as they need to cover the costs of all the at-risk properties or as those at-risk properties get um, developed. Right now, we're looking at about half a million properties at risk of losing affordable insurance, um, but that's going to increase to nearly 2 million over the course of, um, as the weather 
progresses. And there's various statistics that show that throughout the report. Uh, because now people uh, psychologically, do the slides really come up poorly? Um, psychologically, um, people tend to price risk once, it, once the risk is deemed risky enough. So for example, uh, and we've seen this in markets. So part of what banks are interested in is the climate adjusted value. When will our mortgage actually start getting lower due to the risks it faces and won't be increasing over time? And that's a forward projection metric. So we're seeing, um, uh, currently we're gonna, we've got about, so, so typically the market's a little bit laggy in terms of pricing that risk. So right now we feel like there's an undercorrection of 1.4%, about 1.4% of the total market value in the UK could be lost if everyone was purely rational about their decision right now. And we expect that number to drop to 7.5 under uh, RCP 8.5. And, um, and the greatest risks are right now it's inland flooding, as you're probably aware, but it will be overtaken by coastal inundation uh, later in the century. So you can download the report here. I'm assuming this presentation will be available after the event, so that, that link will be available. Uh, it's live now. Um, or you can go onto xdi.systems and then click insights and blogs and you'll be able to access the information there. And I encourage you to read it and use some of our servers if you want to find out if your house is at risk or of any property of interest to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. Um, one thing that strikes me about the presentations we're hearing today is that things are coming together. Having looked at adaptation for 20 odd years now, it's, it's really good to see Resilience Hub and adaptation themes all coming together. We need to, because we need to adapt urgently. So the next presenter is myself. I'm going to talk about the Infrastructure Operators Adaptation Forum and looking at best practice and knowledge in sharing climate resilience. I'm John Doerr, I'm a visiting professor at the University of Surrey, and I've chaired the IOEF since its inception in 2012. It's a group that's a bunch of volunteers from many organizations, and we've got over 70 members, and we meet every four months as a group, and we usually get 25 or 30 people turning up to the meetings, which is really good. We were originally part of the Environment Agency's Climate Ready service in the early 2010s, and that stopped, but we still get support from the Committee on Climate Change and from the Environment Agency and from the University of Birmingham as secretarial and other support. And I'm the volunteer as the chair of, of this group. The organizations that are part of IOAF include this list here, operators, business associations, professional institutions, government regulators, and academia. And there's two, couple of the, the uh, members in, in the audience live here just now. Um, business associations include people like Energy Networks Association and Tech UK. Tech is um, a data ICT, it's for information communication technology organization. Um, we've got other energy organizations like National Grid, Network Rail, Highways England, Transport Scotland, Transport for Wales, um, the water industries represented by Yorkshire Water principally. And we also have Energy, water, transport, ICT. Yeah, that's the four sectors that we look at. Like Anya talked about earlier on, these are the organizations, the sectors underpin the operational society. On the government side, we have a number of government bodies, DEFRA, Department for Transport, and we have regulators such as the Office of Rail and Road and Ofgem and Off Water have in the past come along to IOEF. Uh, we have representation ports from ports sector, the air transport sector, and the list goes on and on, 70 members. So we're quite a, an eclectic bunch. I also said academia, academia. I couldn't quite see that with the reflection on the screen down there. But yes, we do get some um, universities like University of Birmingham and helping 
all of us to understand the issues of interdependencies. Now, the terms of reference, the remit that we have, includes a vision for our assets and services to be resilient to, day, to today's natural hazards and prepared for the future climate. So it's not just future climate, it is about today's natural hazards. And our aims are on this list here. And you can see it's supporting national devolved administration and local government policies on infrastructure and adaptation planning. And we do sort of get consulted and help on things like the National Adaptation Programme. We also help to inform weather resilience and adaptation planning right through to practical measures, the actual action, not just the policies and strategies, and share knowledge among ourselves. And we'd like to, the aim to enable a more integrated and evidence-based approach to adaptation. Integration comes from understanding what goes on in the other organizations and trying to have a common view as to how we go forward with adaptation. And there's a word here as well, champions. I know, know some organizations don't like the word champion, but to develop people who can actually work inside organizations and spread knowledge and experience adaptation. And the last one of the aims is to support activities of other groups that might not be directly related in adaptation, but a strong theme I'm picking up just now from my work in adaptation is net zero. We in the UK can probably afford to adapt to everything, but we need to think about net zero because with some of the technological solutions, we will find that we're producing too many greenhouse gases to, to adapt in a net zero way. The benefits of being a member of IOF, and there's a list here, and I don't need to read them all out, but one of the key ones we've got is about accessing knowledge and information, support of adaptation generally, but in particular to help get consistent views to help organizations respond to the adaptation reporting power which is in the Climate Change Act. The bottom one as well is quite in interesting to influence key research projects and to learn of research. And I'll just mention a bit about how we do that in a minute. So the way IOEF influences the adaptation effort across the UK includes being a source of knowledge for researchers and practitioners. And I list here the projects and programs we've been involved in in the past, such as the National Adaptation Plan and CCRA2, the Climate Change Risk Assessment, the second round and the third round. And most recently, some of our IOEF members um, were helping as they do with CCRA3. And we have had some of the people who have been drafting chapters in the CCRA coming to IOEF and asking for support and running ideas past IOEF. There's a positive second bullet there, really positive. I keep getting feedback from some of the IOEF members about how if it wasn't for IOEF, they wouldn't have made this relationship with other organizations, understanding and, and building in that knowledge of cross-sector interdependencies into their work. So some of the stuff we've heard today about cascading risks, uh, some of the uh, information we've heard today about systems, systems thinking and, and, and how everything is interconnected. We've actually helped to build up some of these projects and build the knowledge and turning the research into practice and also informing the research from the practical point of view. Input into reports, you very often are asked for views and sometimes we can put together an IOEF view into reports. We provided some input into the Infrastructure Commission's, the National Infrastructure Commission's resilient study of last year, the Anticipate, React and Recover report. So there's some input into that from the IOEF as a body, but individual organisations also have provided input into such things. 
And some of our members have helped to shape international work on adaptation, such as ISO 14,090, Adaptation to Climate Change, the first adaptation standard that came out of ISO, and ISO 14,091 on vulnerability impacts and risk assessment. Some of our members have been on ISO committees driving these, and some have actually been on the UK Mirror Committee feeding into the development of these international standards. And we got a mention, IOF got a mention last year in the adaptation communication from the UK to the UN. So we think that's a really um, good testimony to the value of the IOEF. How we work, we have three meetings every year, and sometimes we can have ad hoc groups in between meetings to work on various issues. Indeed, for arrangements for this COP, we had an ad hoc set of meetings set up, and that got a few of us together to help with the arrangements for, for presenting at Resilience Hub. Every meeting we usually have two topics of interest and they might be sort of research led topics and Mike Woolgar's presentation earlier, I remember having a presentation on that some time ago, um, interacting risks in the UK, but there might be practical issues like using adaptation pathways or developing capacity for adaptation in organizations. And there might be presentations on reports like the NIC report. We had a nice presentation about that about a year ago on what that was recommending. We then have usually something like a half hour session, especially if we're in a live meeting, a half hour session going around the table with current topics of interest, which can be sometimes one or two lines from somebody, but it sparks another conversation that was racing off by itself. And when we meet in person as well, we've had a good round of networking. We usually have a half hour get together, then the meeting and the networking is really powerful, makes those relationships, makes it all work. And I think, even though I say to so myself, I think the IOEF with this way of working has been of immense benefit. We want to do more and we'll try and do more over time because there are just a few of us that do the secretarial and organizational uh, side of IOEF, but lots of interest. And, and we're going to, uh, I think, move on with that in time to be able to do more influencing research and picking up from research into practice. So that's uh, a short run through IOEF. Thank you. So I think we've got um, 20 minutes till we wrap up and the plan was for to try uh, a short panel discussion session with the live speakers sitting up on the stage here. And we had a couple of questions to post to the panel, but I just wanted to pause for a minute there to see if anybody has any burning questions from the live audience that we could tackle. Yes. Yeah, we've got a mic. We've got a microphone coming, so that'll be quite handy. Sorry. Hello. Thanks. So, hi, I'm Francis Heil from Atkins. I'm a principal engineer in climate change and resilience, and I worked with the National Infrastructure Commission on the report you mentioned, John, the resilient infrastructure systems. Um, and, and one of the recommendations we made to the government in that report was around uh, developing resilient standards um, for infrastructure operators to, to um, enhance their systems to meet those standards and test um, to ensure that they're demonstrating they can meet those standards. And I think um, on reflecting, and this is something that Mike touched on too, um, about collaboration between different infrastructure operators, that there can be an optimum level, I suppose, of, of headroom that each infrastructure provider might, might, might provide, but, but headroom comes at cost to consumers or to customers. So how do we get collaboration that isn't, um, that, that is most cost effective? Because um, I think in, in some ways, an example we looked at, we looked at the Lancaster flooding example, actually. And um, in that case, we saw that ICT, uh, to, telecommunications and internet failed quite substantially. 
And when we engage with um, telecom companies, they're, because it's uh, less of a regulated environment in the telecoms market, it's more of a free market environment, there's a standards differ depend, dependent on companies. And um, companies may not have a reason to provide backup power, for example, or backup anything if it's um, not coming at a cost advantage for them. So it's, I'm curious about the ideas. It seems quite, um, it, would be, it would be nice to think we could see collaboration between infrastructure providers, but when there's such different incentives and different regulatory frameworks, how do we, how do we achieve that? Um, so yeah, would be keen to hear your views on that across the panel. Thank you. I think if I may um, start off with Anya, yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, so I think there's an excellent example of where this has worked well with the Greater London Authority have the infrastructure mapping application. Um, and this is where they have asked voluntarily, admittedly, but it is uh, they have asked a group of infrastructure providers to provide data within a secure environment. Um, and they are sharing that with each other to allow that kind of um, interaction and understanding of what those interdependencies are. I think this is a, a really good um, kind of first step um, on the way towards, you know, maybe having standards around this and having uh, understand, because I think the first, the first thing is that understanding what the differences of the standards that they each hold are um, is important. Um, but if they can share that data in a secure environment, um, and they've all, obviously they've all signed non-disclosure agreements, et cetera, that allow them to do that. Um, so seeing some, something like that um, happen on a wider scale, I think might be able to um, move this issue forward. Okay, Rohan? Uh, we come at it actually from the opposite direction. So where um, best of interest is the most important driver. So, um, for example, if you are the shopping centre company that relies on the power network to function and we are able to tell the shopping centre company how the power company is treating that network, um, they are able to provide back pressure to say, you've got to lift your game. Otherwise, we're going to start putting in backup generators or solar or whatever. Um, so providing transparency to the market on the decisions by these other institutions in very quantifiable terms. For example, um, the way that plays out in the real world is, for example, we just did work with a company who wanted to do a shopping centre upgrade and they were redoing the roof. And they said, we want this roof to be able to be non-flooding on a one in 250 rainfall event. What's the probability distribution of that, you know, 30 years out? Because this roof, we're going to do it once and it's staying there for the next 30 years. And so they then, so we can work out these probability distributions that if you want it to survive a one in 250 in, in that year, it needs to be built to a one in 500 standard now. And so by putting hard numbers on the, and quantifiable numbers on these things, you create the business case for pushing back against the institutions. So the standards are really important, but also enabling the institutions themselves to, I suppose, push for their own resilience and their own resilience planning is important. Thank you. And Mike or, or Emma? Yeah, I mean, I, I um, can you hear me? I hope so. Um, yeah, I sort of, I sort of agree um, <laughs> with both of you. I think Rohan's got a, a really good point that particularly in the, in the commercial um, area, I think it is incumbent uh, upon the, uh, the entity which is at risk to to, to really make uh, all the moves they can to secure their opportunity. If you think good asset management is understanding not just what you've got and, and what it's for, but what it's going to be a, a affected by. And so this is a good set of information, a good set of data that can help them to fill out more insight on that. And then they can make uh, their plans, which might be investment, it might be um, a negotiation with a, a supplier, it might be negotiations with um, other groups of people who can support them, uh, mutual support in, in, in certain events. And that's, that's a decision that they would make based on the information and insights. I think it becomes, going back to Francis's question, and we have spoken about this before, Francis, um, you know, where you've got regulated industries, um, there is a policy issue, which is uh, at risk or at large, if you like, because um, 
the idea of providing just investing in in headroom uh, willy nilly is 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 clearly not going to be acceptable because it adds costs to all parties it costs to all consumers so there has to be um, it's much more complicated in a sense in, in those areas but again i think that creating the the data set the insight that uh, rohan's platform which i haven't seen before uh, purports to to do seems to me to be a really good way forward to start having people talking about the problem because until people recognize the problem and the scale of the problem they don't actually start doing anything about it so throwing some good information some good insight into the area uh, is is a, is a is a great step forward so if we've got well just a quick response rohan because Okay, so we've actually yeah. done this for three governments. So New South Wales, Queensland, and British Columbia, and actually Victoria. So where instead of getting everyone to do their own headroom, uh, we run everyone's infrastructure and then said, if you fix that one substation, 10 institutions benefit. And if you fix that one mobile phone tower, so it's identifying the, the points of the infrastructure where you get the most derived benefit for the least mm -hmm. investment. And that's a much more cost-effective way of managing these systemic community-wide risks Excellent. at a cheapest cost. Thank you. Emma? Um, I think, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, Hello? yes we can. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I was just thinking, <laughs> I think it's really interesting. <laughs> I think it's really interesting that um, Victoria and British Columbia, the governments invest, New South Wales was it you said invested in this? Because I was, I was just thinking about how Anya started this by saying it's um, in London, we have this voluntary sharing of data and the IOAF is predominantly um, a voluntary aspect that many of us contribute to. We also voluntarily write um, sections for the climate change risk assessment and things like that. And it makes me, it makes me wonder, you know, it seems almost crazy because infrastructure is fundamental to modern society. And a lot of it is, um, a lot of the underpinning resilience seems to be voluntary at the moment. And I wonder what we can do to raise the profile of adaptation. John. Nick had a point as well to make. I think those are just building on everything that said before. If you then bring in the dialogic element and explore people's options, what the maturity of their response to changing risk will be. Um, people, will, different organisations will have a different, different appetite to respond or a different level of risk. So this is a group of people, you know, just for the sake of example, you're bringing the communications and the ICT people around who said, well, that's all very well, but we're just not going to. Then everyone else has the opportunity to say, okay, well, I didn't recognise that risk. How do I factor that risk in? How do I respond to that risk? Do I find alternatives? Then as part of the dialogue, you then start, if, if, if the ICT people say, okay, well, that's how they're responding. To, is that, are those the choices we want people to make? If they are, okay. If it's not, then maybe they can reflect again. So bringing these different levels of information, but allowing people to engage in that way so that they can see how people respond, work out what their options are, and allow that continued dialogue and push it through different levels of climate change, then people can say, okay, this situation is dynamic too. I might be ready to put up with to that point, but not beyond that point. Absolutely. Can I just add one of my own there? Because about a year ago, um, I was involved in study for the UK's Strategic Priorities Fund, and we looked at policy statements, policy documents in the UK, and how the, the guidance supported resilience building. And one of the things we found there was that there's lots of good policy statements, but they're not backed up with firm enough language. So there's so many, good example from the highways side was that highways engineers are being frustrated by development because development is meant to have sustainable drainage systems built, but there are get out closets. If you can prove that things are too expensive, then you can get away from putting in a sud scheme. And I, I, I get on a platform like this and say, I don't like the word expensive because it's subjective based on what people think traditional economics are about. 
And the other thing we've got to do there is think about different type of economics. And Prince Charles said that two days ago here at the COP about thinking about reframing how we think about economics. But that's my little hobby horse. Jan, you had a point to make. There's a microphone across. Um, Thank you, Jan. So actually, it was a it's a linked question, um, but actually moving on a little bit from this particular discussion is that okay? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay, so we I'll take maybe a le bit less muffle. <laughs> um, so the last two days we had a an event in the International Maritime Hub with the ports community looking at adaptation in ports, climate change adaptation, and the question was asked about whether or not the ports that were speaking have, have been considering the viability of the port in 50 years time. So they're making investment decisions where the investment, the infrastructure has a life of between 30 and 100 years. They're making those decisions now. And the typical response was, um, well, you know, particularly sea level rise. We know roughly how much sea level is going to rise. We can... Um, uh, we can design the sea walls or the key walls or whatever so that they're high enough. Okay. But if you look at the reality of what's happened when ports have been hit by extreme events over the last few years, we see access roads and underwater. We see flooding from around the back. We see um, problems when we've seen it with the pandemic, the same with onward transport, with um, in certain cases with heat waves, with extreme events, extreme heat, no power. And, and I just think there's a bit of a disconnect here between um, the theory and the practice, if you like. And your exercise in Somerset, I think, you know, if we were to do that at a national level, UK, but, but also other countries, as I go, well, I'm going to invest in this port. This port's in a low-lying area. I can build it as high and as strong and as deep and as wide as I like. But if I've got no onward road or rail transport, if I've got no energy, if I've got no water, if I've got no workforce because people have moved out, and we see this again with ports in the Philippines, when you, when you get a typhoon through, the port may, can be as resilient as it likes, but if the local community's homes are flooded, the people don't come into work and you can't get aid in because the port isn't operating. And so I think we have a, the, the issue, you know, we're talking about the components of the issue, but actually resolving it in practical terms. I mean, your exercise in, in Somerset, I can absolutely see that look of horror on people's faces when they realize that the environment agency is thinking about not defending this area anymore. So that's part of my question is how do we actually translate that theory into practice in reality with these real people? But then the other side of the question is, is blight? Because we do have this uncertainty and your information that you just showed horrifies me because I live in Lincolnshire <laughs> and I see Lincolnshire is dark red. Um, and, and how do we, and again, it's about long-term commitment. You know, so on the, one, on the one hand, you have people hurriedly selling their houses and moving out of Lincolnshire because it's dark red, but actually what it relies on is the same commitment that the ports rely on from the environment agency or others. Not that they're thinking of, you know, what they're gonna do now and next year, but what they're gonna be doing in 30 and 40, 50 years time. So, I mean, it's just kind of food for thought, but, but as a practitioner on the sharp end, it's like, okay, well, we know what we need to do, but how do we do it? Thank you, Jan. We'd like to pick that up. Nick. Nick no, can, I, can I just respond to that and say, but I think you're spot on, but that, that how do you do it starts off from people feeling that there is a sense of, A, what the issue is, and connecting that. And, and, and this is an entry point exercise. And out of that... You probably don't know what's going to, we've done this lots of times, lots of different places. You never know quite what's going to come out because actually people move in to that with one view, come out with a completely different view. But the question, quite often the questions that they ask shift. And there may be a point at which they say, we realize even more our professional integrity is offended by this but the system won't allow us to change, right? So there needs to be a bigger discussion on that. And that's part of the decision, decision system mapping. Okay, well, what do we do need to do to shift the system to allow the right thing to happen? But there will be other times when good things can happen. 
you know, and, and opportunities do come. Um, so one of the examples would be I mean, Lisa out of that piece of work on the on the sea level rise stuff. We were coming across risks that the, the region wasn't taking any notice of, but Lisa was very interested in at the central was able to shift some of the decision making within the organization. So in the real world, starting these conversations shifts what people start thinking about and pushes it out there. And if it's not dealt with, it's still out there. And there's still something that can be picked up and addressed. And if it starts to be shown to, to happen, then people say, well, I told you so. Why didn't you do that? And we also talked about this. What can we do? it? So I just bring that up. This is, these were real people, as you know, and, and real things happen. Uh, yeah, just to respond to that as well, Jan, I think it, it's really important that uh, we share knowledge in this space, you know, like bring things to life with actual case studies. There, there are so many examples worldwide where people have collaborated and responded to these issues. We don't need to reinvent the wheel with every single um, uh, time that there are all of these interdependencies, but we need to share with each other how we're responding to these things um, in real life. Um, yeah, it's not working. I think I, I absolutely get what you're saying, but I think the problem is, you know, you take the horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And I think a lot of these investment decisions particularly in private sector at the moment, and particularly where there's no financing institution involved or if there's no financing requirement on climate risk, if, they, if those organisations don't think climate change applies to them or think it's for the future or whatever, then they're not looking for and they're not open to these. The, and that's, that, I think, is the hurdle rather than necessarily the sharing of information, although that's part of it. I think the hurdle is how do you get the horse to drink? <laughs> So, I think we're, we're really running out of time. I'll just see if Emma, Mike, Mike's got his hand up. I'll take one from response from Mike. Uh, yeah, just going back. To, uh, yeah, just going back. To, oh, God. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think um, in terms of investment um, and, and decisions that people are making, you know, if, if they're making their, their own decisions with their own money, that's one thing. But I think if you if you see there's the CCRI, the Climate Change um, Risk Initiative, which is the uh, the finance institutions in London, pension funds, etc., they are developing much more um, sensitive guidance to their own members, if you like, uh, around what constitutes a, a climate safe investment uh, and how climate might impact upon the viability of investments. And that will drive people who are going to the banks, that will drive people to make decisions which are more rational uh, in the face of climate change. I think. Going back to, to Anya's point about, uh, about and to Nick, Nick's point about getting people involved, we're in a situation now which is quite rapidly evolving about how to do stuff. So the old verities that we had before, the so-called policy monopoly where people and smart people sat in dark rooms and came up with ideas, and this is how we're going to make it, this is what we're going to build, is, is actually not necessarily going to be quite as tenable in future because there are lots of... of um, things, stuff that's going to happen, which is going to affect many more people than we have previously thought. And those people need to have some way of getting involved with it. Having information, as per Rohan, Rohan's um, uh, bit of uh, equipment, seems to me to be a really good way, because if people do understand that there is an issue and that they understand how that issue um, is uh, evolving in, 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 the face of, in, in the face of their environment, then they've got an idea, then they've got some way of, of beginning to engage in the conversation about how to resolve it. And if that means selling up and moving out of Lincolnshire, that might be a decision that an individual makes. But it's not an ideal decision from UK PLC's perspective. So, but, but if you haven't got the information, you can't make the decisions. So I think, I think it's, it's important to, to engage. It's not going to be easy because it's not how we've done stuff. From Rohan or Emma? I'm uh, yeah no no I, I agree. So we uh, I mean the part of our reason for the release is that this problem has become apparent, quantifiable, understood. Mm -hmm. It's why we do it. It's it's uh, if we don't do it, then what will happen? Everyone will leave Lancashire on a case by case basis every time some event happens. So you see a community shrinking, but that 
we can't, that'll happen all over the UK. And so it's got to be addressed now up front as a community. Emma? Nothing more from me, John. I just wanted to thank um, all of the speakers and the audience today and to uh, remind you as chair that it's three o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, can I to that and say thank you to the speakers who became the panelists, both here and online, and for people who came along to to listen today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.